Rings of Power Episode 2, and we left off with Galadriel jumping into an ocean in an attempt to delete herself out of the show, and honestly, I know how she feels. But we open up with constellations in the sky, and probably should remember this because I think it comes in later. So Galadriel spends five minutes staring at them because she's in the middle of the ocean. It's not like she's got anything better to do with the time. Like, survive. Now, I did think they'd start this episode with some magical means that she had to survive. Turns out, no, her plan is just to swim. Kind of understand why Gilgalad thought you'd be better off in Valinor, because if you stayed, you were just going to cause trouble with your own stupid decisions. No, literally, her plan is just to swim off for hundreds of miles. It is impossible to accurately summarize how stupid of a plan it is to jump into the middle of an ocean and just swim. The elves actually did really horrific things to get those boats to go from Valinor to Middle-earth in the first place. Turns out they didn't even need to bother, they could have just swum. But we've got the Hobbit standing in the middle of a fiery crater, because if a meteorite just landed, the first thing I'd do is stand barefoot in it. Oh, it's the fires of Sauron! Is it Sauron? Ooh. There's more interesting mystery in a Jerry Springer paternity test than there is in this. But this is a wizard who came down to Earth, crashed in a meteorite, but coincidentally had just enough clothing on to protect his modesty on a TV show. Can't speak, can't remember, but at least we didn't have to see him do the windmill in the first episode, so, you know, that's a plus. So Nori here, yes, I looked up her name, she's standing on the edge of a crater. She's like, I've seen people with dangly bits before, I've just never seen a full-sized one. Nori! I don't know why a friend's shouting at her like an angry parent. But then it turns out the showrunners are just big fans of the Carry On movies. In an attempt to pull her away from the edge of the hole, we get this weird exchange. You can be I don't know how she fell in. Someone grabs my arm. Oh no, I'm rolling into a fiery pit of death. Now call me crazy, but if I landed into a fiery pit of death, the first thing I'd do is get up and try and get out of it. It's not hot. I don't care if it's hot, it's a fiery pit of death. In the first episode, we had, ooh, evil is cold. Now we've got fire and it's also cold. They really want to imply this guy is Sauron. <laughs> but because it's lukewarm, she decides to stay in the fiery pit of death. Now, if you were a tiny Nox and Stargate SG-1 had just left your planet and a guy from a meteorite came and crash-landed into your garden, what would you do? Is it this? What are you going to achieve with that? I know you ate some dodgy raspberries in the last episode, but unless you think they're hallucinogenic, of course he's real. Why are you poking him in the face? He's just fallen from the sky. Maybe he needs medical treatment, not some lunatic poking him in the eye. He's dead, come on! To be fair, if he's dead, he's less likely to be concerned that you're poking him in the face. But then he grabs her hand. <laughs> we get a face that hasn't been seen since Will Smith stumbled in on his wife with the pool boy. And he just starts randomly screaming. <laughs> and I have to say, the facial expressions of Nori during this scene are absolute gold. <laughs> but this guy's seen the Obi-Wan Kenobi series and is a big fan of the final battle with Vader. All of the rocks start floating and like, are you going to start nailing her in the face with them as she sort of holds her elbow in the way? That scene really isn't as impressive as Disney thought it was. They were like, oh no, we can make rocks float. And in this scene, Nori and the music are doing much of the work. Everyone's face when we heard the line, this is a necessary redress of balance. But he sucks all the fire into him. We get deep and meaningful eye contact. This show loves its blurred close-ups. And then he collapses and all the fire comes out. And you kind of just leave the scene thinking, well, that was pointless. We didn't do anything there. In fact, we're right back where we started. But obviously the first thing on everyone's mind is... Your mom's gonna kill you. Only if she finds out. I also don't know how Nori's responsible for a man falling from the sky. But don't worry, she's a woman with a plan. You're not telling her, neither am I. I'm not sure it's as simple as that, love. Everyone saw him hit the ground. You can't leave him like this or the wolves will get him. So that's not who we are. That's not who you are. That's not who you are. I'll gladly leave anyone just to die in the forest because I'm an absolute little cow. Proud of. Seriously, love. It's not something to be proud of. It's like, I can't carry him alone. Are you going to help me? I don't think either of you could carry him. Have you seen the size of him compared to you? How exactly are we supposed to carry a giant? Wait, I just said that, love. Now you're just repeating my own lines. But don't worry, Lenny Henry, who's been out of work for a couple of decades, which kind of explains why he looks like this, likes to tell the audience that that must have been a star fall. Because, you know, it's not as if we watched it on the screen or anything. How would they have known if you didn't tell me? But you're like, how many steins do you need? We should move. Now everything's getting really dangerous here. Let's just run away. A TV series with a group of creatures that just run away from anything excitement and interesting to watch is definitely a great foundation for a TV show. Nothing's going to happen and we're going to deliberately avoid anything entertaining. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see how this story evolves. But Lenny Henry is convinced that the audience are just complete morons. And so he has to make sure that you understand the plot point. This does not bode well. 
I'm glad he told me. I don't know how I'd keep up with the sheer pace of this show otherwise. But he's looking around and Grandyfoot just starts stealing things from around the place because we need the resources to look after the man that can't say anything, which is definitely going to be an interesting plot point for the rest of the show. So they stole some lanterns and a chair and a blanket and start pushing him up a hill. If only we can hide him in a cart for the night, then everything will be fine and we'll work out what to do later. Are you even putting Of course I'm putting a larger! Like I say, it's a carry-on movie or last of the summer wine. I think the hobbits are meant to be the comedy center of the piece to take the edge off the unadulterated monotony of the rest of the cast. But they have to keep telling us about Nori. Oh, this is not an adventure. You can't keep turning away. You always do this. You're very adventurous. You're very adventurous. You just keep breaking the rules. You're so adventurous. You can inform me about her character by making her character do things rather than having people do nothing and constantly tell me about them. But they have a conversation about how if anyone finds out that we've helped a stranger, we'll be in trouble because we're just meant to hide from them. And then this happens. And like I say, last of the summer wine. No, a wheel gets stuck in the rut. Don't oh, creep! No, 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 the wheel burrow, it's not fine! That is literally just his chair rolling down a hill with him in it. But they finally get him back to the cart. For some reason, they're just obsessed with him. I can understand he's a man that fell from the sky and that makes him weird, but they just seem amazed by his hands. <laughs> oh, look, his hands close around things. What's he going to do next? Is he going to use rudimentary tools? Now, the Irish Times described the new hobbits as filthy, hungry simpletons with stage Irish accents. But after poking him for a while, and no, not like that, they decide to finally let him rest. Cover him up so he won't get seen by a passing simpleton, because he's not covered up very well. Like, seriously, if this is how you hide your houses, everyone would have seen them decades ago. <laughs> All I'm saying is maybe his feet hanging out of the enclosure it might be a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> kind of makes the rest of the covering redundant. Do you never wonder if some wonders are beyond our wondering? Yeah, another bit from the trailer. But a friend's like, why are you doing this, Nori? It's like, I don't know, I found a random guy out in a field and is like to not let him die to wolves in his sleep. It's just the common decent thing to do. It's not like she's Sauron and she's like, <laughs> let him die. Like, it's my responsibility. I feel like everyone is your responsibility. No! Normally, you wouldn't need an excuse to help somebody in need. Apparently, you do in The Hobbits. Could have landed anywhere and he landed here. I know it sounds strange, but somehow, just know he's important. It's like there's a reason this happened. Like, I was supposed to find him. Me. I can't walk away from that. Not till I know he's safe. Can you? Yeah. Oh, there's some greater grand plan in the universe. People are planning things. Chess pieces are being laid on the board and you're like well okay if there's a big master plan for the good then does that mean there is one for the evil side but they agree not to tell anyone which i thought had already been decided otherwise what was the point of bringing them back here but apparently no we've only just decided even though we agreed earlier yes this story makes a lot of sense and we cut back to the lovebirds at the abandoned village i hope you're all prepared for some incredible lines Everything's on fire, there's complete destruction. The earth is riven with fishes, like in a ground shake. Yeah, that's right, she thinks all this was done by an earthquake. Renowned for setting fire to buildings, aren't they? Also, a town a day away wouldn't have felt any tremors at all. No, that's at all perfectly normal. But the else retort is, well, there's no bodies, no wounded. So if there had been bodies there, you would have agreed that it was an earthquake? Look, I know this is meant to be a long time ago, but the people aren't supposed to be mentally deficient. But she says perhaps everyone just ran away. They didn't bother to run to the nearest town, which is where she came from, for help. No, they just ran off randomly into the forest somewhere, never to be seen again. Sounds reasonable. So they enter this house, and she says the names of the people who lived here. She knows who they are personally. So you'd think she'd care a bit, but apparently, no. Even when the elf finds a big massive hole in the ground and drops his torch into it. This was no ground shake. Someone dug this passage. I'm glad you told us someone dug a hole. I couldn't possibly have realized when you showed it on the screen two seconds ago. Generally, people will pitch things at their level, and that means that the writers wouldn't know there was a hole in the ground unless you explicitly told them. Someone dug this passage. Thanks for that, dude. I don't know what I'd do without you. Something. Men did not do this. Her contribution is a man with a spade didn't do it. And he's like, go, warn your people. They're the closest village. They're the ones that are going to be next. And then we get quite possibly the most glorious exchange of the episode. I must follow the passage. You don't know what's down there. That is the reason I must go. Oh, it's like Shakespeare. I need to go down that hole, bro. Why? It's there, innit? It's like the spirit of Tolkien flows through them. So she's disappointed she doesn't get to spend another night with him and goes back to her town. He pulls her back because this scene hasn't dragged on enough. We're gonna have to stare deeply into each other's eyes before I jump down into this tunnel for quite a while, which is handy because it's a very cheap set to make. I'm going to hold this very bright light in front of me so I can't see into the darkness behind it. I thought your armor was meant to be made out of wood, not your head. Oh, it's a tunnel. We really want you to know that this is impressive. 
The music really does a lot of the work, don't it? But now we get the bit that I think is meant to appease the Silmarillion fans. No, I'm being serious. Alron's talking to Celebrimbor. He's like, oh, that's Feanor's hammer. The hammer that made the Silmarils. They're the jewels that held the light of the trees of Valinor. Look, that's all we could reference from the Silmarillion. It's the only rights we have access to. But we want you to know that we did read the books. We did read the books, we promise. But then we get two lines back to back that have literally nothing to do with each other. Strange, isn't it? One object could be responsible for creating so much beauty and so much pain. True creation requires sacrifice. What? I was drinking a cup of tea and it was really gorgeous, but really expensive. I was in Hawaii once and got sunburned. How is this conversation? I don't know. But Alron just looks at him as if he said something really deep. I think to try and trick the audience into making them think he did. But we're going to talk about the Silmarils a bit and how they almost converted Morgoth, even though it's completely unrelated to the entire plot. It was only when he cried and he saw himself did he actually change his mind. Maybe it's a sign that everyone should get involved in their feelings and just start weeping. Feanor's work nearly turned the heart of the great foe himself. What is my never accomplished. I mean, you invented maternity wear for pensioners. It's not really the widest customer base, but you know, it's nice to have a side hustle. It has turned my heart, my lord. I think we could tell that just by looking at you, mate. The heart of many an elf. But especially yours. But I aspire to do far more than that. Kella Brimble won't be satisfied with just the heart of one man. No, he needs several to satisfy him. <laughs> I don't even know what the scene's meant to be. But he says, I'm fed up with petty trinkets. I want to make something of real power. And he's like, look, we've got to drag this over five seasons. I can't just tell you what I want to make. Now, I can only focus on how. I need to make a forge, a tower forge. This will be hotter and more pure than anything else. And for some reason to make it really hot, we've got to put it at the top of a really high tower. As we know, that's how all forges work. The flame will be as hot as a dragon's tongue. And when it's only as hot as something that already exists, it's not really that impressive, is it? But the problem isn't the creation of it. The problem is just the speed. It's like, it's actually really easy to build. I just need manpower and the king won't give it to me. The high king cannot provide one, so he has sent me you. Seriously, I don't know what's going on with that exchange of glances, but um, this is meant to be a family show because it's well known you have the power of many men. What is this scene? But he's like, if we can't get the help from elves, have you considered it outside the elves? Can't imagine who that would be. And with that, off they go to the dwarves, Khazad Doom. Now it's quite a long way and journey on the map and you get a sense of this from this landscape showing you the terrain they had to travel across. So then it's weird when they just fast travel across the place in the exact same clothes they had in the last scene and they don't even have anything with them. No supplies, no camping gear, nothing. They literally just teleported here instantaneously. Also, bearing in mind that Alrond is meant to be a politician, we get this line. An alliance with the dwarves would be the diplomatic achievement of the age. Yeah, because I'm sure Alrond wouldn't know that, right? Again, we're telling a character something he already knows specifically to explain it to the audience because we think the audience are thick and they won't be able to grasp it if we don't just spell it out for them and spoon feed it to them. But we just get a load of expedition dumped right outside their hallway, despite the fact that they've been traveling for days and apparently never discussed it. I'm friends with Jorin. Oh, I've heard they've expanded their halls. They sing to the rock. They're only just talking about this now. What did they talk about on the journey? The Teletubbies. But it turns out Celebrimbor has always admired the dwarves because they also build things. But he's like, don't worry, I'm friends with these people. They'll definitely let me in. So he asks the dwarf if he can go in to see Jorin and he gets told to piss off. That's how I knew he really had met Elrond before. So realizing he won't get in, he decides to invoke an old dwarfish tradition, a challenge of sorts. Then he tells Calabrimbor to just piss off for three days. It'll be fine. And when he comes back, they'll be allowed in. And Calabrimbor's just like, yeah, fine. No camping gear, no supplies, no food. I'll happily just walk off for three days and come back. Yeah, it's no biggie. <laughs> now, all of this is meant to show Elrond is a great politician and diplomat. So the dwarves escort him inside. We literally just ditch Celebrimbor outside like uncivilized savages. And now I want to prepare you for what is an incredible mix of really good CGI and terrible CGI literally simultaneously. Now at first, not too bad. Still looks fine. Now this may not come across in OBS, but when you watch it live, there's a really big problem. It's not that the CGI background themselves look bad. It actually looks really well done, but it's this weird effect that Thor had in Thor Love and Thunder. It's like they filmed in the volume. No one seems to fit in the scene. You've got one world here and then you've got the people walking across it and they don't look as if they fit in into the world at all. So when you have this and it's just like the CGI has a doom on its own, it looks great. It looks fine, no complaints. But when they walk through it, it's awful. Which is also something I pointed out in the trailers, which was this shot. This bit was especially bad, as is that. And it wasn't helped by this scene either where you're mixing a real life ceiling and people with a fake background behind them and none of it looks like it fits. I can't remember used to having this problem with green screens before, but it is a really modern day effect. Maybe we've approached the point where it's just uncanny valley the entire thing and it makes it look worse. But they could have solved all of this by just having CGI on its own and then him walking down actual corridors. Keep them separate, don't mix them. But it's your confidence in being so good that you can make one fit into the world of the other 
that really let you down. But once you get into the set on a smaller scale, it all looks good. The dwarves and the beards look great. I really like the dwarf armor. I'd prefer that the women were more beard-like. Again, if we're gonna have this thing of people can't tell the difference between us, well, uh, I shouldn't be able to pick it out that much. But in walks Durin. And Elrond still thinks that he's his friend and they're all gonna be happy and big buds. No, they're not. He just walks around calling him an elf and just starts speaking about the tradition. Now, this is an ancient tradition of the dwarves. They should all know what's about to happen, but don't worry, we're going to explain it to them anyway, even though they already know. For the audience's benefit. Again, stop telling people things they already know. Has invoked the right of Sigin Taga. And now I'm going to tell you what that is, despite the fact that it's an ancient tradition that you definitely are all aware of. The Dwarven Test of Endurance. Because none of them realise that. But essentially what they're going to do, they're just going to smash rocks, break rocks, and if the elf can't match him in endurance, then he gets kicked out of Khazad Doom and can never return to Dwarvish lands ever again. And for an elf, forever is a pretty long time. Now, for some reason, Alrond, despite the fact that he was the one that asked for this, still seems surprised that it's actually happening. Does the elf understand? The elf does. So they begin and bring in these rocks. I'm not sure why we just had a load of rocks hanging around that we needed to break just for this special occasion. But they start smashing the rocks between them and goes on for a very long time. Cut back to the hobbits, because one storyline can't keep anyone entertained, so we have to keep cutting back and forth across all of them, because when nothing happens in all of them, if we keep doing fast cuts, then we may trick people into thinking that actually something is going on. She finds the wizard, and he's not there anymore, probably means she doesn't actually find him, but instead he's just scratching on a rock. Look, he fell from the sky, you can understand a little bit of, uh, brain trauma. So he's scribbling random crap on a stone, she says hello, when he just starts screaming at her. <laughs> All the trees start, like, attacking her, and it all gets really dark. He can't talk, he doesn't know what's going on, but apparently he can use magic just fine. And she's like, no, no, save me! It's me, you've got a brain, don't you, you thick idiot! Rock into my face, you wouldn't hurt a little hobbit, would you? More close-ups on eyes, because we've made a character that can't talk, who interacts with a group of people specifically bred to not do anything, and run away from anything of any interest. So the only way we can make you think something is happening is doing lots of close-ups. Here's some more close-ups for you. But then he collapses, and we get a little sense of scale between the two. And she starts trying to teach him sign language, which doesn't work if you can't actually understand language in the first place to teach them what the signs mean. Like this. You won't harm me, do you? How's he supposed to know that means deal? You walk up to someone and just go, How are they supposed to know what means? So he pulls his ear and she's supposed to think that means deal, despite the fact that he can't talk, we don't know he speaks English, and we may not even know what deal means, regardless of whether you pull your ear over or not. That's a start then, isn't it? You have no idea what that's a start of. You don't even know if he understood what you just said. I'm Nori. Again, how's he supposed to know what that means? You're trying to teach him sign language with a language you don't even know he understands. As far as you know, we could think that means forehead. How's he supposed to know what that means? Seriously, this is like the blind leading the mentally deficient. I don't even know what the scene's meant to be. It's like, what are you at your name? You. Yeah, I mean, he didn't understand Nori, so he's definitely understand what's your name. She's like, you don't even remember your name. He, he can't talk, love. So she decides to feed him snails because, you know, when you've just fallen from the sky, the first thing you want to eat is snails. Did you eat where you're from? Not that filth, love. So she just decides to choke one of them down. Honestly, when it looks that appetizing, I can't understand who he could possibly resist. Now, back in the Hobbit town, they're trying to lift a tree because this is really entertaining stuff here. And they asked Nori's father to do it. He's like, oh, but th Nori was really supposed to be doing it. She was so looking forward to it. And when you see what he's supposed to do, yeah, Nori definitely would have managed it. And the wizard starts going back to drawing on the ground. Well, Nori's father lifts the log. Yeah, that's what Nori was supposed to be doing. Yes, he's struggling to do it, but he wanted his little tiny daughter to be doing that job instead. I'm sure that definitely would have made it easier. So they're using this rope, which uh, looks like it's about to break. Incredibly smart of him to have used it in the first place. And he starts drawing all of these lines in the mud. She asks if he's drawing some kind of map. And we keep cutting back and forth between the two things. Can we lift the tree? Can we not lift the tree? Oh, is it a map? I'm gonna need you to contain your excitement. So he keeps drawing as if she's supposed to understand any of this. And then the rope snaps, meaning that the entire weight of the tree is now on his shoulder. Literally no one comes to help him. He's surrounded by people. No one comes to help him. This is also the job he wanted Nori to do. We're continuing to draw in the soil. No one bothers helping him. And then his ankle breaks while the other guy's drawing in the soil. I think we're supposed to see these two things are connected. I don't know. It's only the cuts that imply that because otherwise he's just drawing in some soil. There's no sign he's doing magic at all. It's just the music kicks off and we keep flicking between the two as if you're supposed to think they're interconnected. I don't think they are. But the rope snapped. That guy struggled, was holding it on his own, and if you look at everyone around him, they're all just sitting down. They're like, yeah, he's fine, he'll manage. 
He'll manage. He's just a guy with dangly bits. It's not like it matters. He's annoyed that she can't understand him just drawing in the soil. It turns out he's drawn them on tree block. I don't know why he had to draw them in the soil as well. Oh, I couldn't understand this text over here, but now you've written it on the ground. It's all plain to me. It's not how that works. She's like, I don't understand. I'm trying to help you. And then he starts screaming at her. <laughs> Probably the most British thing about the show. When you're a Brit and you speak English at someone, if they can't understand, you just repeat it slower and louder. That'll help. So a mate runs in to tell about the father's accident and he is about to blast her off the face of the earth till the little one gets in the way. So they go and look at the father's ankle and it's broken. And they're like, oh, but we need to travel. How is he supposed to travel on that? I don't know. I mean, you've got carts. Can't you just put him in a cart? I don't know why this is a problem. Like, how bad is it? Can he pull a cart? We need to move in a few days. Is he the only person that can pull a cart? Surely you've got more people than carts. If you don't, what on earth are you doing? So it's like really bad planning if you need literally every single person in your entire village to be perfectly healthy when you move. How bad is it? Can he migrate? Lenny Henry there proving that he only cares about himself. Art imitates life. But they start moaning that he can't pull a cart despite the fact that he could just go in one. I don't know what the problem is. Cut back to Galadriel who is literally just swimming across the ocean back to Middle Earth. She had no plan, no magic. She was just going to swim for hundreds of miles back to Middle Earth. Every time an elf gets into a boat, it's completely pointless because they could have just swum anyway. This is the single piece of worst writing in the entire series so far, and I don't think they even realize why. But either way, she's swimming across an entire ocean. She gets a dagger out because she thinks danger might be near. My elf senses are tingling. But it turns out, no, she just happened to meet a raft in the middle of the ocean. I don't know if you're aware of this, but oceans are actually quite big places. As you travel along one, you don't tend to just meet into somebody else who's also traveling along. It's in a raft. The stupidity of this is only beaten by Star Trek Discovery, where she went through a time wormhole, popped out into the middle of space, and hit a ship. The probability of this happening alone is enough to make this absolutely ridiculous. And the only reason it's happening is because the writers need it to. Or is it all because it's somebody's master plan? But they hear Galadriel yelling out and she's right next to the boat and they can't work out. Do we really need her on the boat? I mean, she will eat some food. So they start arguing about whether she should be allowed onto the raft. Meanwhile, she's just climbing up onto the raft. Seems like your argument's redundant. But then as she's climbing onto the only raft that can possibly save her life in the entire ocean, we get Hellbrand saying this. Tides of fate are flying. Yours may be heading in or out. So Galadriel hears that as he tries to help her onto the boat and this is her reaction. Guess I'll just die. What is your plan, love? Oh, well, I was going to go on your life-saving raft, but because a man tried to offer his hand to help me up there, I'm just going to swim the rest of the way to Middle Earth. But she seems to realize how stupid a plan is when the woman goes to help her on board. Like, I will not accept the hand of a man, but if a type B helps me up, then obviously, obviously now I'll accept. And so she goes on board. Oh no, it's just her secret senses tingling about possible danger. That's why. Yeah, that's absolutely the message the showrunners wanted to convey in that scene. So they start pouring water into her mouth. And the guy's like, no, not until she gives us answers. What are you doing in the middle of the ocean? And she decides to lie to them rather than say that she was an absolute moron. Oh no, I was on a boat, I promise. It's just my boat was attacked. I didn't jump off it and think I'd swim across the entire ocean. That'd be stupid. Honestly, if she told them the truth, they probably wouldn't believe her because it's that ridiculous. So it's like you would attack then. Oh, we were by a worm. Yeah, this is one of those well-known ocean worms. But the woman starts to explain exactly their story, that they've been on this raft for two weeks, and then we get this weird set of lines. Does she look dangerous to you? Looks can be deceiving. I don't know if you're getting the extremely subtle hints that we're throwing in your direction. I mean, seriously, it's hardly a Sherlock Holmes plot, is it? But this guy's been watching her all along, and he realizes, oh no, she's an elf because her ears are different. And as we all know, slightly pointy ears are the only distinguishing feature that separates elves from human beings and they're supposed to have some kind of angelic ethereal glow but apparently no they're just they're just humans now they're, they're really quite boring the only thing you have to do to hide yourself as an elf is just grow your hair a bit it's fine it's fine but they all turn against her because she was lying i don't think she ever said she was a human an elf could have been on a boat but at this point they see another boat approaching and they start screaming for it and he's like wait wait for the sails we don't know who it could be it could be a pirate i mean at this point i'm wondering if a pirate's worse because you're just in the middle of the ocean on a raft with no food so you know how much worse can you get it's like, do you want to be skinned alive? Is starvation much worse? I don't know. I've never really compared the two. But they realize somehow that that's actually their ship. Except their ship was attacked by a worm. Yeah, that's your worm uh, right there. Because as I'm sure you know, worms are absolutely renowned for having fins. But still, even though it's heading right for them, Hellbrand's like, be still, don't move. 
its vision is based on movement, even though it's underwater. So it travels underneath their ramshackle set of rafts, but then catches them with its tail and smashes the entire thing apart. The woman on the boat, who is the only one the Galadriel actually trusted to pull her onto the boat in the first place, then just pushes it into the water. It's like, oh, you've led him right to us. More close-ups on the ice because we're desperate to make you think that something is happening. Halbrand notices that she's in the water and that she's not coming back to the boat, and he decides to separate his raft from theirs while they're all just screaming like lunatics. So he pushes away from them as they get absolutely annihilated by the worm which has a tail and fins. She swims off without even a second thought about any of them. I guess it was her original plan to swim to Middle Earth anyway, so it's not like it was a big change for her. It's only a few hundred miles, I'll make it. But then she turns around, is it chasing me? Is it going to eat me? Oh no, what's that coming through the smoke? Ah, it's the worm! Or worse, it's Halbrand, the Type A! Now, bearing in mind, she is in the middle of the ocean with absolutely nothing to do except swim to Middle Earth, and Halbrand is her only actual safety in this entire place, and he's coming over to rescue her. Think she might be grateful. She even swims up to him voluntarily. And yet, when he goes to offer her his hand to get her up onto the boat, she's like, oh no, oh, do I have to? I don't really want this. Before eventually kind of begrudgingly doing it, I'm saying, well, if I have to, then I guess I'll come onto your boat and save my life instead of just drowning out there. You're twisting my arm. So he just asks her a name and she's still like, oh, I don't know whether I should tell you. Oh, I think it's Galadriel. She will not tell him anything, despite the fact he literally just saved her life. And he says he's Halbrand and he wants to know where she wants to go. I mean, she was just swimming in that general direction. You could paddle that way if you want. Back to hitting rocks. Literally the only thing that happens in the scene. Oh, look, I'm hitting more rocks. Alron gets really tired way before the dwarf, which is exactly what you'd expect. But then after a moment of consideration, he swings with his hammer and misses. So the shaft of the hammer hits the rock and not the hammer end, and he breaks the hammer. He gets given another hammer and immediately surrenders, which allows Durin to uh, get the victory. Everyone's cheering, all the pride and the glory. And I think it's meant to be a deep political scene that actually Alron realized that Durin needed some kind of glory, some kind of victory. And so even though he probably could have carried on, if he actually defeated Durin, he would have really annoyed him. And so whatever negotiations are going to happen between them, they would go down way better if Durin was actually in a good mood because he's been victorious. And so Alron deliberately broke his hammer, showing that he wasn't just throwing the entire thing because he'd been smashing loads of rocks and then eventually broke and actually outlasted a whole hammer. And that allowed them both to save face while also still losing. And you can see that his glance is like weighing up the situation of exactly how he's receiving it. Now that is what I think is meant to be shown in this scene. I'm not saying it was shown very well and I may be giving them too much credit, but I think that's what they were aiming for. Now, one of the issues is you put in a scene like that, where you're also surrounded by other scenes where you go, this is a hole and I need to go down it to find out what's on the other end. You do come across as the fact that no one really gives you credit for what you actually do because you keep treating your audience like idiots. We should probably find a level we want to pitch at and leave it there. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. Bumper sticker. <laughs> but he's like, you've lost, now you're banished. And Alron says, maybe you'd like to escort me to the gate. Gladly. So he gets escorted up the lift, and Alron can't believe that everything's changed. I mean, it's only been 20 years. It's the blink of an eye for an elf. But they start bickering like a married couple. I can't believe you didn't call me back last week. Oh, it's been 20 years. Well, I've never seen you before. I can't believe you've never done this. You missed my wedding. Oh, bad kids. Oh. Like, seriously, on Twitter, I've seen people shipping these two, and... I after this conversation, I can understand why. Literally going at each other like an old married couple. You missed my wedding! I don't know why you care! The birth of my children! You're the father of one of them, I don't know why you couldn't see it! I keep expecting Jerry Springer's security guards to come in and start breaking them up. You cannot barge into my mountain and demand I welcome you with open arms! I'm gonna cry! It's like you cannot claim that which you discarded. I've been so used, I remember when we were younger and go out drinking and now I haven't seen you in ages. I was nothing but a tool to you. Something to discard after you were finished with me. Like, seriously, what on earth is this conversation? Yes, every man has a conversation like this with his friends. But they hit the top of the elevator. He's like, do you have anything to say? Yes. Congratulations on your wife and your children. I would love to meet them. I don't know how I'm going to keep up with this political intrigue. So he comes down to introduce him to his wife, who is, obviously, Deezer. And he's like, look, all you're going to do is apologize, don't stay for dinner, and then leave. Got it? Got it. And then we get this piece of acting. You're staying for dinner. He's leaving. He's staying. He's leaving. He's staying. I have to admit she's a good actress because she's quite happy and bubbly in this. Absolutely an entirely different person to real life. Now, the entire rest of this section is almost entirely pointless. We get to see the little dwarf kids running around with big helmets on, and the whole thing is like, Durin's like, yeah, you can eat, but don't be too comfortable. Oh, I'm really angry with you, but I'm not really angry with you because I'm actually secretly happy that you're here. We get a conversation between them about how they're actually met. 
and that she sings to the rock and that resonates so that's how they find out where they should dig where they shouldn't dig where the veins are and all that kind of stuff this is the first time he's like oh resonating with stone i've not heard that before so she actually gets to explain something within the universe to someone who doesn't know what it is already which is a basic thing but literally something which we haven't had in the rest of the episode it normally it's like oh this would be really important and be like, yeah yeah i already know dude i don't know what you're telling me this scene goes on for ages just all about how they met and it is entirely pointless one of the big problems with this episode is just why why is this scene in what does it exist how does it move anyone forwards how does it move the plot forwards and the answer for the entire two episodes is it doesn't really there's no point for anything existing we're not further on than we were when we started we've just got some characters names they're not setting things up it's literally just time wasting it's like oh yeah we did actually meet and then we got married and have kids and i'm like yeah i know this why is it going on for so long Aaron's still like oh you look very happy together he's like yeah you should have been at the wedding oh let it go dude you're not married to him enough but Jorin realizes you know you only came here because you wanted something and Aaron doesn't really have any excuse his only excuse is, no, coming here was my idea, not the king's. As if that's any better, you still came here because you want something from them. It's not beneficial to both parties, not unless you're going to let them use the forge. It turns out the tree behind them was actually a gift, some seeds from Elrond. One which Durin pays a lot of attention to and grows all the time, and they didn't think it would grow underground. So it, I don't know why they buried it underground in the first place, but it did. And the reason why is this awful bit of script. Some called him a fool for believing it would grow in such darkness. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. Bumper sticker! That literally means nothing. It's like saying love is the greatest power on earth! I mean, I'd probably say it was a nuclear bomb or a volcano if you're on about nature. But sure, we can go, love is so powerful on a bumper sticker all day. I'm sure people will think it's deep because it sounds like it's philosophical. People think just because they don't understand something, it must be so clever and deep. No, that's not how that works. How could it not grow in a home like yours? Because it's underground and it wouldn't have had any light. I'm pretty sure the reason why it's growing is because they put light on it at the back and watered it and cared for it. Not because they were married and had some kids running around in the background. That's not how photosynthesis works. Then again, if we get into photosynthesis, we'd also have to teach them how buoyancy works between rocks and ships. One looks upwards. No. You're not leaving already. I mean, I feel like I've been here for an eternity, love, and literally nothing has happened and no plot has moved on. I wanted to leave two weeks ago because that's how long it feels like I've been here. I fear I've overstayed my welcome. You've overstayed my patience. But with that, he goes to leave. And Jorin's like, no, don't leave. I'll miss you otherwise. I was like, oh, here we go. I can see the fan fiction already. But with that, he asks Alrond, okay, Tell me your plan and why you came here, even though I know it's just to use us. We travel back to the raft, and I know what you're thinking. The plot's going to move on now because we're back to Gladril. Uh, no. Here's one for the shippers. Gladril's on the ship. Maybe she was born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. I mean, come on, dude. But while he's making sure that he looks good for literally the only woman in the nearby vicinity, she notices this pouch around his neck with some kind of symbol. And of all the stupid lines to write for two people on a very narrow raft, this really ranks up there. You needn't keep your distance. Like seriously, she's one foot away from you on a raft. How close do you want her? I can, I shouldn't ask that. I can already see the fan fiction. But instead, she still doesn't trust him. I just don't understand how you could abandon all of those people that were about to get immediately killed. They were getting attacked by a giant sea creature. I don't know why you could possibly have wanted to leave. It's because I'm a survivor. Yes, we're just using stereotypical default lines from a 1970s RPG. When he starts accusing her as a deserter, because I don't know why else an elf would be here swimming through an entire ocean like an insane crazy person. I'm still not quite sure of the reason why myself, to be honest. Don't have the look of someone to whom things happen by accident. I'm glad you told us that, because literally no one could work that out by looking at it. Don't even know what that look's meant to be. This is literally just the script telling you things about the character that you're supposed to know about their personality, because it doesn't have any idea how you're supposed to show that. It's like, no, it was no accident she jumped into the ocean and decided to swim for hundreds of miles. That was deliberate. Yeah, get that, but why? Which means you were running, whether towards or from something I haven't yet decided. I've just met you, and I've been on a raft where we haven't said any words together, but I I immediately know every single thing about you. This isn't suspicious at all. But he says, look, I'm not annoyed at elves. I'm annoyed at orcs. They're the ones that destroyed my homeland. <gasps> orcs? Orcs are a sign that Sauron is near. Tell me where the orcs are, then we can go and I can continue my quest to find him. I'll definitely be able to fight Sauron on my own. Have you ever told you about the power of a girl boss? But she's like, no, I understand what you're going through. The people you've lost. I understand that pain. It would take me longer than your lifetime to recite all of the names that of the people that I have lost to the evil that damaged you. So tell me where your homeland was so I can get vengeance. Yes, Galadriel's all about vengeance still. Vengeance and revenge. It's like a really, really slow, boring version of Taken. I have a special set of skills. 
I can swim for hundreds of miles. If you want to murder orcs and settle the score, don't dress it up as heroin. If there's one thing literally no one can possibly think about this entire series, is that Galadriel is ever heroic. She's one of the many problems with it. But he tells her the orcs are in the Southlands, which is weird considering she was going north before to where Sauron was, and she doesn't think that South being on the opposite end of the world from where North, where she had proof that Sauron was. No, that's not suspicious at all, love. No, we're definitely going South now all of a sudden. But she's like, you know where my enemy is and you will take me there. I've got my own plans, Elf. I've got my own plans. I hope you notice the very subtle hints we're dropping here. And immediately as he says that, a storm comes, a lightning storm, and now we get the, I'm sure, very expensive and it looks very nice scene of them in a storm. Absolutely zero point to it, doesn't move the plot along in any way, it's literally just time being taken up because it looks pretty. Yes, it looks pretty, but what is the point of it? Which is the entire problem with the whole show. Why are these scenes happening? How does it move anything on? But meanwhile, she comes back to her own town and starts warning them that, you know that town over there, it's all been destroyed. Of course, this guy doesn't care. He's like, oh, what do you mean they've all been destroyed? I'm sure a sinkhole just, you know, absolutely annihilated an entire town. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. It's one of the most bizarre scenes, the fact that he just doesn't trust her. Why? Because she doesn't have dangly bits. I, don't, I can't think of any other reason why he wouldn't trust her. It's just like, we're not going to listen to you. It's like he's talking as if she's the woman that cried wolf, as if she comes in every single week and goes, just another town's been destroyed and you don't need to worry. He's like, yeah, it's, there's always seeping vapors. There's always big, massive earthquakes in that completely wipe out entire towns and everyone dies and there's no bodies. It's, it's perfectly normal. They're actually writing these people as so ridiculously stupid. It's entirely unbelievable. And I know. It's a fantasy series. But you can't write everyone as having 25 IQ just because it allows them to be bigoted enough to get your next plot point in. I'm telling you, you're all in danger and you're ignoring me. Uh, honestly, at this point, I just leave. Look, if you don't want to listen to me, I'm off. Bye. I will not have this gossip, Bronwyn. Oh, it's gossip. It's gossip. The fact that you went to an entire town and it was destroyed by fire and there was a big hole there, but everyone got abducted through it. It's just gossip. You're always doing this, love. You're always getting it wrong. It wouldn't have been so bad if they'd shown that actually she did have a history of getting stuff wrong. No, they just don't believe her for some random reason. I've seen landslides less dangerous than a wayward tongue. What about the destruction of an entire village? Is that more dangerous than a tongue? But then they imply that the only reason she said any of this stuff is because she was having it off with an elf. And actually, they're just all massive bigots. Which was the point of the entire scene, just to get to that punchline. Why does everyone act like they're all stupid morons whenever they're around her? Because the plot requires them to, to give you the message. Inviting them elves back, having them gone is a relief. Most of us, anyhow. As the point finally reveals itself. Oh, look, that's what we've all been secretly thinking all along. That's why we don't believe you. Been all oh, one of them elves. Ooh. Oh, we all know her sort around here with them elvish folk. It's like, uh, come on, dude. But her son is in this town and he's uh, hearing scratching under the floorboards by the mice. He decides that the way he's going to solve the problem of mice under the floorboards is to go and destroy the floor with a poker. No, I'm not joking. He literally just starts destroying his own floor with a poker because someone's scratching underneath it. Mice. Perfectly normal behavior. It's entirely realistic and will definitely draw people into the story. So he starts looking through the hole at the mice. I don't know why he expects to see. He thinks it's a mouse. He probably didn't expect to see a generic jump scare from the 1980s, though. Ah, there's something in the hole. Now, the elf has been going through this tunnel system in order to find what's at the other end of the tunnel system. I mean, he knows something dug this hole, so he's probably expecting to find the thing which dug the hole, you'd assume. He sees claw marks and a nail at the other end, which got torn off while it was clawing through the soil. I mean, that's got a sting, surely. So now he knows something with big, massive claws has dug the hole and he's still going down it. So he must be fully expecting the creature at the other end. He sees a shadow of the creature at the other end, which he is expecting. So he's still sitting here, seeing the shadow, waiting for it to appear. Until the exact moment, one of them actually appears around the corner and he's like, Oh no! I never expected to actually find a creature down here! And immediately runs! And this guy is petrified, just running for his life as fast as possible. What did you think was going to happen? I went down this hole, I found claw marks on it, realized the creature was here. I continued on to find what was making the claw marks, and the moment I found them, I just ran away. Seriously, I feel like I'm losing IQ points as we go on. Now, the stupid part is, well, the more stupid part, he finds this really narrow part of the tunnel system, which he can't really get through. But whatever's behind him dug that hole. So the creature behind him dug that hole specifically for itself. So 
it's going to be faster through the tunnel system than he is because it was designed for the thing behind him. And the thing is right behind him chasing him through the tunnel. So he's going to get caught. Rather than turn around to fight the thing, which definitely will catch me because it's far faster than I am, he still continues to push himself even further into the tunnel, which is too tight for him that he can't fight in because it's too small. At this point, I fully expected whatever was behind him to just grab his legs and eat him. It's the only logical conclusion to the story. Instead, he gets trapped in this tunnel. The thing is literally coming right up behind him and somehow he manages to get through it faster than the thing behind him. And he plunges into water as if that's going to save him because again, the thing behind him also dug this tunnel underwater, so it should still be able to come after you. Somehow he gets to the other end alive. Plot armor is the only armor that could possibly have enabled this outcome. And we get to the trailer scene. He's there staring at the water. Bubbles come up from the water. <gasps> I'm going to get attacked in the front. But no, there's so many hands behind him and they grab him and pull him into the darkness. I mean, did the one behind him in the tunnel know they were there and it was just like forcing him towards them? Because otherwise that one behind him just let him deliberately escape even though he could have caught him at any time. I, I have no no idea what's going on. Meanwhile, she runs back home. I'm assuming she's going to leave anyway and just, you know, leave the town to their own devices. That's what I do. Except there's a problem when her entire place is destroyed. I'm not entirely sure why. Because now there's a big hole in the floor. Hey, their son must have gone mental going after that mouse. But she starts shouting down the hole for her son. Yeah, he's definitely in there, love. Be very careful with your wardrobe. This was almost an 18 plus. And it turns out, actually, no, he's hiding. Now, at this point, I don't know what happened before she arrived. Because there's a big hole in the floor. He's hiding and the entire house is destroyed. So did the thing from underground see the kid break through the floor, the kid hid, then the thing destroyed the house and decided to jump back down the hole? What's the point of that? What is it meant to achieve in this situation? What is its motivation? Because I thought that in the last town, they basically kidnapped all of the people in the village. So why are they just ransacking homes? But the kid's talking to her. He's like, oh, get out, go. I'm like, are you not going to come with me? You know, it's, it, it's safer out there than it is in your little hole in the wall. But he's like, no, you leave. Go. I'm going to stay here with the creature so I'm safe. I suppose he is from the same gene pool as everyone else in the town. So, you know, average IQ of 35. She hears movement in the tunnel and decides to run out. We get this example of how fast they can move through tunnels. Definitely faster than the elf went. The kid just closes the door on himself and hides in the wall, despite the fact the door is open and you can leave and flee to safety and everything will be fine. No, I'm going to stay in danger and just put this little bit of wood in front of me. It's like when a kid is scared in bed and he's like, oh, there's an axe murderer coming up the stairs to get me. Should I run? Should I flee? Should I sell for help? No, I'm going to pull the covers up. That'll protect me. So she has a chance to run out the door, but then she realizes, no, my son's an idiot and he hasn't come with me, even though we could both escape. So I've got to stay and protect him because he's refused to leave for some reason that no one quite understands and I can't un possibly understand why someone wrote. So she runs into a wardrobe and we get the classic horror, oh, I'm going to peek at you through this door because for some reason I bought a wardrobe which was terribly made and you can just look through it. So up comes the creature. She starts staring through a crack like the villagers have been doing with her and the elf and he's just like looking around the room not doing anything particular. This guy opens the door a little bit so he can see what on earth is going on. Acting so terrified, but if you're that scared dude, you should just left through the front door when you're all of the opportunity in the world. And for some reason, the creature's just like rifling through all of her stuff. Is he really interested in botany or something? It's, it's weird. But then she jumps back, knocks that pot, and it starts to fall. If that hits the ground, it's going to smash, and the guy's going to realize you're there. Should probably stop that, love. So she goes to grab it and stop it falling, but it doesn't matter because apparently the thing already knows she's there and breaks in despite the fact that the pot never fell. So why are we having the pot move in the first place? So she screams, the kid opens the door, the monster makes her scream. Very, very, very fast cuts. I didn't even realize the kid was in the fight at first. You see about three frames of something flying through the air, then there's a knife, and then somehow he twists around and he's fighting a kid. And I'm like, how did the kid get there? I thought he was attacking the woman at first. Apparently, no, the kid has flown across the room, teleported like Calabrimbor going to a dwarven kingdom. And here we are. So they have a fight and the guy is basically beating both of them up because they're not trained fighters. It's understandable. He flicks the table and the guy across the room. But don't worry, they're all fine. Everyone's invincible in this scene. She lobs some kind of red powder at him because, you know, she always keeps these kind of dangerous substances on her to lob in orcs faces. I don't know. Later on, is she going to invent some kind of weapon of war or something? She pulls a tiny little blade at him. I don't know what she's planning to do with that. Butter him. But the kid decides to run upstairs. She grabs a sword off the floor. I don't know where that came from. I like charges him as if it's a spear and jabs him in the side. Now he turns around, which throws her against the wall. And I'm not joking. The very next split is suddenly the blade getting stuck in the stairs. And I don't know how it happened. I mean, he just turned around and it went in there fine. But apparently now he's stuck and can't move. 
The editing in this is so fast, jolty, and jumpy, not only is it difficult to follow what's happening, but none of the things actually make sense cut to cut to cut to cut to cut. It's just you have to accept that whatever happens in the next bit happens, and uh, even if you don't know why, just don't think about it, it's fine. It all, it's all going so fast, you're not meant to think about it, just accept whatever the end result is. So he's stuck, the kid gets a door pull from Formula One, and just jumps off the ceiling with it. Which frees that guy from the stairs. They were all entirely safe at that point until the kid did this, and now he's free again. And just lifts him off the ground. Maybe you could get a sword and just start hacking at him while he's off the ground or something. No, instead, neither of them do anything. So the guy swipes the rope and he's free. Despite the fact that a few seconds ago he was stuck in the stairs. He's going to very slowly crawl across the floor towards the kid in a prone position, fully exposing his neck. And despite the fact that the mother's going, Aah! as she charges across the room, he's not going to respond to it. He's just going to allow her to chop his head off. You know what he'd have to do to counter what she's just done? You welcome, scriptwriters. But apparently no, she cuts his head off and then brings it into the bar. Are you gonna believe me now? If there are any of you here who want to live, we make for the Elven Tower at first light. It's always first light. Gentlemen to bed, for we leave at 9.30. Ish. Ish. There's an even stranger part of this though. You see that window at the back? It's already daylight. Maybe we just leave now and camp out there? And then we get this to the barkeep, just in case you weren't aware of what we were trying to say. Do you understand now, you meaningless peasant? I'm in charge. I'm always right. Empowerment! And with that, she leaves. Then we cut back to the water, and again, yes, it's all very pretty. There's lots of waves. We're traveling around the ocean. Waves are attacking us. Yeah, there's lots of water involved. I'm sure it was very expensive. But what is the point of any of it? It's very expensive. Lots of water. Big tank. Big expensive cameras. How is this helping the plot? But either way, she decides to tie herself to a mast in a thunderstorm it's not like lightning goes to the tallest point or anything. And she's trying to help him. Tie yourself to me, Halbrand! And he's just looking at her as if, are you a lunatic? Why are you tying yourself to a tree? Have you ever heard you don't stand under trees in thunderstorms? Apparently she hasn't. So lightning literally comes down and strikes the boat where she is. It's all right, Al's are immune to electricity. Also, if an electric strike came down and hit your boat, not only would your entire thing be on fire, but Halbrand would definitely be unconscious afterwards if he was human. So he's found out that apparently only that bit of the boat was destroyed and now she's in the water. He sees the rope that she used to tie herself around just going into the water. And as she's sinking, he's just watching it spin out. He's not even trying to grab it or anything. She just plunges into the depths. He's still not grabbing the rope in any way, shape or form. <laughs> eh, let her drown. But no, he's come to save the day. He's pulling himself down on the rope. Maybe I could have stopped you floating, but now I'm coming down to save you. I'm not always evil. Sometimes I do a good deed. I'm not just a survivor out for myself. So he's trying to undo with a rope. Then he sees her dagger and he pulls the dagger and cuts the rope and they both go up to the surface. Oh no, my breath might be running out. What if I don't make it? This is so intense. No, we both survived. It's fine. What are we going to do? Swim to Middle Earth again? Oh no, maybe we could go back to that tiny little bit of raft that survived that definitely wouldn't still float. We've got no rations, no water, no way to get up to Middle Earth. She might actually be better off swimming at this point. But no, this time she gets onto the boat first and she offers him back onto the water. See, all before it was everyone else helping her onto the boat, but she's just so strong and powerful. Now... She can repay the favor and she could save Halbrand. There's absolutely no way he could possibly have ever got himself onto that raft if it wasn't for her. But now she trusts him. Now he saved her. Now she will help him as one of her own fellowship. And all it took was a very coincidental lightning storm. Him saying that he had plans and a piece of lightning striking exactly where he needed it to land for everything he needed to happen to happen. I can't possibly imagine what's going on. So then we get the wizard and they brought their lanterns. Now I know what you're thinking, how on earth do they have lanterns? Well, apparently they decided to cruelly trap a load of fireflies inside the lanterns. How do they feed them? How do they keep them there? How do they capture them? We don't know. Don't ask. No questions. Don't ask. But they're like, we've got to move. We've got to travel. We don't just stay in one place. We roam. We emigrate. I thought I could help you, but now we can't. I'm going to have to leave you here. I'm so sorry. And it's like, you, you cannot help me. But he has an eye on something else. And it's not just the camera zoomed in on his face to make you think that something mysterious is happening here. No, it's all incredibly deep. It's not just a thin veneer meant to make you think it is. So he starts to like really annoy all of the fireflies and they just start breaking out of the lantern. Oh, isn't it so pretty? And he takes them one by one into his hand and starts whispering a language that we don't understand because... What's he saying to them? I don't speak firefly. You don't say. But he's sending them off into very specific places and she goes behind them and realizes something. He's made star constellations. Do you remember when Gladriel was looking at the star constellations at the start of the episode? The end of the episode comes full circle to the start of it. This is incredible storytelling! And something they did in the first episode as well. Can we get it next episode? Is it going to be a hat trick of glorious crap?
But she's like, this is how we help him. He wants us to find those stars, those constellations. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't know where they are. What are you going to do? Walk around the entire Earth looking at all of the stars to try and find the exact spot he wants? But with that, it's as if he's run out of energy. He collapses to the ground and all of the fireflies die. Oh no, did he do that? Did his magic drain them of life force? Is he evil? But then Jorin's talking to his father. He's like, actually, Alron didn't realize what was going on. I was playing him all along. I was pretending that I didn't like it. I was just pretending that I was his sad, bitter, disappointed wife and he hasn't visited me in 20 years. Really, it was all dissembling. We can only hope that he didn't actually realize what we've discovered. That we discovered a literal mystery box. Oh, no one knows what's inside it. It glows. We cannot allow the elves to realize we have discovered this mystery box. Why should you watch episode three to find out what's in the mystery box? So then they're leaving and he starts hiding the Sauron blade. I'm definitely taking that with me. Except this time something else happens. Something dark and deadly. He starts pulling his blood upwards against the force of gravity. So you realize this is magical. Hope you can keep up really complicated this plot and then his blood starts to ignite the symbol of sauron on the blade and the blade starts to grow and reforge itself it's definitely something i want to keep with me it's not creepy at all a blade that grows out of my own blood but because the kid is an absolute moron he's like yeah this is all perfectly normal and happy and wonderful i'm taking that thing with me and off he goes your son's evil love i mean i don't know what the show's trying to tell us we need fathers in their home because otherwise all of our kids will worship sauron you've got me convinced we're back on the raft because we don't flick around from character to character enough in the show and both of us are amazed we're alive and we've been found again by a different boat in the middle of the ocean which is hundreds of miles wide finding one person in the middle of an ocean would be astronomical luck finding another one at this point you're just taking the piss and i have one question why why has any of this happened why does any of this exist this episode was better than the first but many of my complaints have stayed exactly the same but i was expecting in episode two something to actually happen you've already wasted your first episode and now we've wasted the second one as well people are saying oh no you're just setting it up okay what every scene should have a point it should go somewhere we should move something and yet nothing happens yes that water scene was very well done it was very impressive i'm sure it was very technical and hard to do why did it exist what was the point of it what did it do for the story because i think i know what you're going to do with the story from it and even if i'm correct and you get all of that done from that scene about what the intentions were and who it proved it to it's still an incredibly long scene to get a very tiny piece of plot out and then you have the dwarven kingdom and that whole thing around the table which was just a waste of time all of that to prove that Jorin has a wife, really. And while the Hobbits were more interesting in this episode, probably because you focused on a couple of them that actually do stuff rather than the rest of them that just want to hide away all the time, you've still got an entire story based around people that run away from anything interesting with a guy who can't speak. Doesn't exactly sound interesting. So these were the first two episodes designed to hook you in, make you excited to see what was coming next. And all I have at the end of it is, why should I even continue watching? Because I'm going to do it for the videos. But if I was just a normal viewer, I don't know why I'd want to watch next week. There's nothing hype worthy. There's no character that draws you in and you think, I have to see what happens with that guy. It's all generic one note fantasy. It's not only not identifiably Tolkien, but it's not identifiably interesting in any way, shape or form. And when I'm watching it, my only question is, why is any of this happening? Why is this going on so long? Why is it worthy of my time? And that is something you should never make your audience ask. Because time is valuable. Committing to a show is valuable. And you should get something entertaining or interesting. Something of value out of it in return. And I can't see anything of value that's come out of this show so far. All you've done is given me a load of names of characters. You've not given me a reason to care about them. And that is all on top of a script which is absolutely awful. Pseudo-philosophical bumper sticker statements throughout the entire second episode as well as the first one. So for a billion dollars, am I impressed? No, I'm not. But maybe you are. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. What did you think of the episode or the review? Let me know. Like the video if you liked the video and subscribe. More videos like this in the future because I've spent so long covering Rings of Power. I am not going to stop now. We're in this for the long haul. So subscribe for more, like the video, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.